Thomas Aquinas, Tommaso d'Aquino, the famous and great doctor of the church, the great 13th century Dominican figure whose scholastic philosophy continues to dominate thought within the overall religious philosophy of the Roman Catholic Church. He was a prolific writer. He was not, however, the most promising of students. At least legend has it that he was a large and rather lumbering chap called by his classmates the Damox, and his celebrated teacher, Albertus Magnus, was persuaded that when that ox started making sounds, the entire world would quake. And in this, Albertus Magnus was correct, in this and in many other things. Thomas was a child of privilege. His father was the Count of Aquino, and his mother Theodora, Countess of Teano. His family was related by blood uh, to the emperors Henry VI and Frederick II. His early promise as a child, schooled by the Benedictines, resulted in, in advanced study in liberal arts at Naples, and it was there that he committed himself to a religious vocation. By the age of 20, um, he is found a Dominican friar, a self-imposed poverty, and now a concerned family would keep him under a kind of house arrest for two years, doing all within and even beyond reason to shake this commitment, but their powers were not equal to the task. It was at Cologne, under the teaching of Albertus Magnus, that his full promise became more apparent. He earned a teaching position at Paris, where he would also earn a doctorate. And by the time of his early thirties, he was a veritable celebrity, attracting the best students and serving as an intellectual resource to the princes of the church. It was only through agility that he actually avoided becoming Archbishop of Naples. I think the history of ideas is greatly indebted to the fact that he never became an Archbishop. Now, outside of Catholic philosophy, Thomas Aquinas is probably best known and most widely read for treatises on natural law. He was tutored in the law, and in the 13th century, the European world again was in possession of Roman law. At this same time, uh, the church needed and required a small legion of legally trained scholars. The daily wars on heresies of one sort and another, not to mention the complexities of the relationships between the secular and clerical world, provided work for an army of lawyers. For a mind of the quality of Thomas Aquinas's, however, law was much more than a set of procedures for settling disputes. It was recognized as an expression of the rational order itself. And so when Thomas Aquinas undertakes a treatise on law, he certainly doesn't think that he's doing something removed from human psychology or from ethics, philosophy, politics, religion. We find his most systematic treatment of law in questions 90 to 108 of the Summa Theologiae, the questions 90 to 108 constituting his philosophy of law. So the place to begin um, actually is not there. It's in the first part of the Summa Theologiae, question 75 to 89, which summarizes his, posi his position on human nature itself. Until you get the human nature part of the story in place, you can't really move to the philosophy of law. Now the format is an established one, found as I noted in the previous lecture in Abelard's Sick et Known. We begin with a question, whether the soul is a body. That's an example of the sort of question. And then we confront arguments for and against. Thus, objection one. It would seem that the soul is a body, for the soul is the moving principle of the body, nor does it move unless moved. Now against such objections is placed the contrary position. Thus, on the contrary, Augustine says that the soul is simple in comparison with the body, inasmuch as it does not occupy space by its bulk. So you begin to see the sick et known uh, version here now in, in, in Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae. And then Thomas offers his own answer, followed by statements designed to meet all of the objections enumerated at the outset. 
So his reply to objection one, for example, is, quote, as everything which is in motion must be moved by something else, a process which cannot be prolonged indefinitely, we must allow that not every mover is moved. Here then is the essential form of the discourse. On the question of human nature, following Aristotle, Thomas adopts the hylomorphic thesis. Man is a composite of body and soul. Hylo, material, and morphos for form, where the soul is the form of the body. Just as the process of sensation is at once a power of the soul, but a process that requires material organs, so the whole man is an enmattered being whose psychic processes are realized through corporeal operations. Nothing uh, antiquated about that view. Now on the question of knowledge, Aquinas distinguishes the human from the divine intellect, the latter being in the very essence of God, whereas the human intellect is but a power or faculty of the soul. In this it is included among several other powers such as sensation, appetite, and the will. Though those are distinguishable as powers, the actual person functions as a person and not as a set of distinct functions. Now this is, this is quite, uh, I'm inclined to say quite forward-looking. The inclination today in the psychological disciplines is to modularize uh, the human psychology into memory banks, short-term and long-term memory, various cognitive powers, uh, ideation and so forth. Thomas Aquinas wants to make clear that we do not function as a collection of parts but as an integrated whole. It is by way of the rational power of the intellect that one is able to obtain or avoid that which the appetites crave. There is sufficient control of the will that it becomes possible to suppress the appetites by shifting one's attention, by considering other options. This is fairly good psychology. And the issue of free will is going to be central to the concept of law itself. For it is the law, both divine and temporal, that holds us responsible solely for what we are able to do or forbear from doing. And so in question 83 of his treatise on man, Thomas summarizes the objections to the theory of freedom of the will, the objections taken from scripture itself. For example, Romans 7.19, quote, For the good which I will, I do not, but the evil which I will not, that I do, close quote. Often the common sense psychologist, Thomas replies that evidence for freedom of the will is provided by the fact that were the will not free, quote, counsels, exhortations, commands, prohibitions, rewards and punishments would be in vain, close quote. That is, the very evidence some might take to support, support determinism, for example, the effects of reward and punishment in controlling behavior, Aquinas shows entail freedom. I mean, you might answer the contemporary, rather radical behaviorist who says all behavior is determined by reward and punishment with a Thomistic reply that says, well, if it weren't possible to choose reward and to choose to avoid punishment, rewards and punishments wouldn't work at all. The animal kingdom includes the instinctual behavior of sheep in the presence of wolves. Here the sheep is guided by what Thomas calls a natural judgment, a judgment that is not free because it's governed by a natural instinct. Man, however, judges on the basis of reason, apprehending what should be done. And herein is the basis upon which law condemns and punishes. So now we can move to questions 90 through 108. We've got this general framework on the nature of human nature, which fits us out for the rule of law, and now we can consider law as such. Question 90 begins the treatise on law with a definition, a now quite famous definition. The proposition to be considered is whether law is something pertaining to reason. And the first objection to this is again based on Romans. Quote, I see another law in my members, etc., etc. In other words, we're ruled not by reason, but by something that reaches the sensitive and appetitive part of our nature. Now Thomas Aquinas replies to these various objections, having asserted that law is a rule and measure of acts, 
whereby man is induced to act. Now the rule and measure of human acts is reason, which is the first principle of human acts. Thomas Aquinas claimed that if our natures were different, our duties would be different. And so to a first approximation, what he seems to be saying, and this of course would be entirely consistent with Aristotle's position, is that to engage in political and juridical questions, one must be clear as to the nature of those who would be ruled. But as Thomas doesn't see the task of understanding the nature of human nature as an essentially observational or inductive enterprise, the sort of thing you might find, for example, in experimental psychology, rather, we gauge the nature of human nature through the arts and sciences of reason. That is, we can assemble a coherent and defensible understanding of human nature, and then, given that understanding of human nature, we can ask ourselves what political and legal arrangements are right for a nature like that. That is, we have to put together first a rational picture of what a flourishing, healthy, wholesome human life looks like. And then, given that ideal, as it were, given that possible life, we then can see how law and various political arrangements conduce to lives lived according to that model. Now you might say, well doesn't this seem to be rather backwards? I mean, shouldn't you first have a developed psychology taking the facts of human nature where you find them and then making the best of a bad situation by putting together laws and political institutions? Well, of course, if you wanted to do it that way, you'd begin with an essentially descriptive psychology, thereupon fashioning laws and governments in ways that match up with the data. But suppose, however, you were unlucky enough to find yourself in a place where everyone was insane, or felonious, or irremediably stupid. You certainly would not fashion a polis to accommodate and nurse your lives of that sort. No, you must step back from the mere contingent characteristics of human beings, wherever you might find them, and ask, what is the essential nature of human life? And then, in light of that nature, what is the good life? Now you see the difference here between a descriptive psychology that goes out and just samples people and says, well, given this sample, people are like that, now let's put together a world that can accommodate that, versus, no, no, let's have a developed theory of human nature as it is in its, not perfected, but in its flourishing mode, and what kind of world, what rule of law, what political organization is right for entities of that kind. Now what is good for man can't simply be what a given person chooses or says is good. A drug addict will certainly choose drugs over not having drugs. The alcoholic will choose alcohol over being denied alcohol. The lazy person will choose rest over labor. The duplicitous person will choose deceit over truthfulness. So a descriptive psychology really is not up to the task. One must reach an understanding through the exercise of reason just what the essential nature of human life is and then on that basis determine what the basic goods are for a life of that kind. Now Thomas Aquinas's deep and enduring respect for Aristotle has him invariably referring to Aristotle not by name but simply as the philosopher. Uh, Aristotle as a philosophical guide and often, but not always, a philosophical authority. Recall that Thomas Aquinas is going to become St. Thomas Aquinas. He's a Dominican priest. His mission in life is service to the church. What he's attempting to get right is the spiritual dimension of human life, the obligations we have to God, conducting our lives in such a way as to be worthy of the salvation secured through the death of Jesus Christ. So this is not someone seeking tenure in a philosophy department, and he certainly isn't going to settle once and for all for the philosophical musings, no matter how deep and penetrating they might be, of a pagan philosopher who died in the fourth century BC. To make the point briefly then, I should say we don't want to read Thomistic philosophy as a gloss on Aristotelianism. The stakes are different, and the stakes, at least for Thomas Aquinas, are much higher. 
Aristotle does become important because Aristotle, as far as Thomas Aquinas is concerned, really was onto something. He understood this utterly integrated nature of those factors that participate in the realization or the stultification of our humanity, the political world in which we find ourselves, the disciplining influences of law, the importance of early instruction, uh, the sources of self-corruption. But whatever we might want to say about Aristotle's philosophy, it is not subservient to any religious view and thus can guide Thomas Aquinas only so far. Now this helps explain why it is that when Thomas Aquinas considers Aristotle's treatment of the virtues, he concludes that the account ignores the foundational theological virtues. If by episteme, we refer to a complete explanatory scheme by which we comprehend nothing less than the affairs of the world. How is that to assist a Christian whose overriding obligation is to know God? But that's the means by which we comprehend the affairs of the world. Of what help is that going to be in that central Christian mission, that unique obligation the Christian has to know the divine essence, how can an intellectual virtue, episteme, get you to the divine essence? The divine essence is not something accessible to the senses as such. And when you go down Aristotle's theory of learning, the means by which we come to comprehend things, of course, at the empirical level, the exercise of the senses really is the, the last word. Now suppose we consult Aristotle on the moral virtues, on prudence and courage and the like. Well, again, Thomas Aquinas places a high value on these. But here's a concern Aristotle never had to deal with in his ethical writings and that Thomas Aquinas had to deal with seven days a week. Salvation. Salvation, conducting one's life in such a way as to secure the eternal reward of heaven. So Thomas understands that to the moral and intellectual virtues something very basic has to be added, which Greek philosophers had no occasion to comprehend, let alone to develop. And that is the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Well, what would Aristotle have made of something like charity? Now Aristotle recognizes that magnanimity is uh, not itself a unique virtue. It seems to underlie all the virtues. The megalopsuchos, the great-souled person, the great-spirited person, the magnanimous person. Well, what's the characteristic of such a person generally? Suppose I were to say something of this sort. Aristotle teaches that we should attempt in every way to perfect our virtues, and one of the virtues is courage. Well, all right, I'll be courageous. Darn it! Now. There really is something missing here, or perhaps there are two words too many, the darn it, do you say? Uh, even if I proceeded to behave in a courageous way, someone might say, look, he's behaving in a courageous way, but he does seem to be kicking and screaming all the way. Now similarly, with any of the other virtues, suppose that although I'm behaving virtually, well, I'm sorry, virtuously, my disposition to do so is really not very magnanimous. So Aristotle is inclined to make magnanimity a disposition required of all the virtues such that the man of virtue not only behaves in a virtuous way but behaves in a virtuous way with the full-spirited positive desire to be virtuous. Now that's about as close as we're going to find Aristotle getting to the notion of charity and it doesn't really quite reach the Christian sense of being sure that you never neglect the needs of others, that you do not place yourself first in the scheme of things, that you exercise restraint when it comes to taking a particular share of something, that you don't even take what perhaps legitimately is your share if in so doing you deny something to someone or to a, a, a person that might actually need more of it. Charity is closer to what the Stoic Epictetus had in mind when he said, never say of anything that I have lost it, only that I have given it back. The understanding that whatever one has is a gift, and that gift requires a thankfulness, uh, an inclination to share, 
But as God has been so generous toward us, so too in our charity we must be generous toward others. Generous toward others in the matter of forgiveness, in the matter of sharing, in the matter of sympathy. So here's a theological virtue, absent which you cannot know salvation. No matter how successfully you might live your earthly life, absent the theological virtue of charity, there will be something fundamentally missing in your moral makeup. So much for charity, then. Now what about faith? I'm not quite sure what the, what the right understanding of faith would be for Aristotle. As a Greek, he would use the word pistis, faith, having faith in something, but faith would probably be the sort of thing that, on a strict Aristotelian account, you might want to protect yourself from. If the word refers to a superstitious rejection of the evidence of sense and the counsels of reason, it surely would not count as an Aristotelian virtue. But that's not faith on the Thomistic account, because if we would know the divine essence, we must recognize that the evidence of sense is never going to be entirely successful. The record there is, the, 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 the record there is going to be an ambiguous one, and rational power will get us very far, but finally it can't get us all the way. It is one of the powers of reason to clarify what is received by faith and defend the discoveries of faith. The two stand in a harmonious relationship. Were reason absent, there would be nothing, nothing at all to faith that would distinguish it from mere delusion. So we do have to understand that there are certain mysteries surrounding the creation and surrounding our place within it. But it is through the grace of God that we can have faith, that there is a providential God in whose image we are made, and that that providential God has provided us with the means of salvation. Now this is a gift we have on a particular construal, and that particular construal is the Christian construal as represented by Augustine and of course by Thomas Aquinas. And similarly, with the hope that a future eternal life will find us properly positioned, that indeed we will redeem the great confidence that God has had in us, that we will have made the proper use of the great gifts that have been bestowed by a loving God, and that although we cannot see that eternal future, we can be hopeful about the prospect, all this comes under the gift of faith. Now the problem of conduct for Thomas Aquinas is the problem of reconciling us to the eternal law. It's not simply a matter of making sure of, uh, that our life is within a political community that's decent and that we're uh, uh, civilly and civically responsible or that we choose good leaders and the like. The problem of conduct now is a very high stakes problem. This is not simply a matter of accommodation. It's not simply a matter of developing our personal virtues and giving up the ghost in the manner of Cleobus and Biton. The problem of conduct now is inextricably bound up with notions of the holy life, the life of deep devotion, a life that is committed to know God and to love God and to become worthy of God's presence in the life to come. You don't hear Aristotle in, in any of these lines, do you see? Now in this undertaking and through this understanding, the rule of law does guide and serve. How is law to be defined then? Thomas gives us a textbook definition if we're concerned with natural law theory. The law, he says, is an ordinance of reason promulgated by one who has responsibility for the good of the community. Law restrains and encourages. It appeals to the rational side of our nature. It assists in the control of the passions and the dispositions of the will. It is not simply some sort of mechanical constraint. Rather, it is a princely rule. You do hear Aristotle here. It speaks to our rational nature, which is our essential nature. The Thomistic theory of law is a natural law theory, much in the sense that Aristotle and Cicero and Roman law itself understood the relationship. 
Law is natural to creatures of a certain kind. The right and just law demands what a rational being would demand of himself were there not competing influences. And of course, what's the culprit? The culprit is desire. When our guard is down, we find ourselves desiring things that are not good for us. Aristotle noting that, that all things that are desired are not desirable. The pleasures of the moment very often trump the dictates of reason. And the hedonistically oriented, self-interested person who would rather have gratification now at all costs is moving in the direction of a brain in a vat so that all there is in the end is a pattern of stimulation, desire, satisfaction of the desire, then the rekindling of the desire, and then a behavior that will satisfy it again, an addiction to desire itself. Now, how do we get protection against ourselves in this regard? Well, apart from the gift of grace and the blessings of heaven, there are more immediately perceptible means of improvement and immunity, and chief among these is the well-ordered state, the realm of justice which commands the assent of reason by its own reasonableness and finds desire itself loyal to it, for it helps to gratify all the desires that are worth having. Now, this is an ideal conception, of course. Taking human nature to be an expression of divine love, Thomas Aquinas then finds the children of God placed here for a purpose, and that purpose is for what is best in us to flourish, and what is best in us is the capacity for an integrated, wholesome family life, for the responsibilities of parenthood, for responsibilities to the church, to conduct ourselves in a prudent and reasonable manner, to desire the good and to shun evil, to shun what cannot be in the interest of a rational being. We do have the potentiality for developing the moral and intellectual virtues, and this is by study and contemplation. And we also finally must deploy, as it were, the theological virtues, so that the form of life we live matches up in a proper way with the life that Jesus lived, a life that was abundant in charity, that was the very epitome of faith in divine providence, and that gave all hope for an eternal future that would cancel out the frustrations and disappointments of earthly life and reward us for the commitment and devotion that we had made during those years of earthly life. Well, never before or since would there be so complete a faith in an age hosting such extraordinary intellects. It is quite remarkable. I mean, if you step back and, in fact, step out of the context of religion itself and just consider the man Thomas Aquinas. This is a towering intellect, the author of still to be translated hundreds of thousands of words of rich philosophy, logic, ethics, etc. An instructed mind, a mind fashioned by the best productions of the classical world, and a mind that at the end of the day turns itself away from scholarship, from writing, comes out of a chapel toward the end of his life reflecting on everything he had put in print or put to paper saying that it, 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 it was pointless, it was just like sand, do you say? That as one who thinks so deeply and so persistently on the meaning of life, a life, an examined life, and examined at such depth and with such sincerity and purpose and gratitude as to find words incapable of expressing truths that somehow and otherwise are known by the grace of God. This is a tradition put in place where the intellectual foundations of the faith are thick and firm, and I should say, even into the 21st century, durable. A great figure in a great age. Thomas Aquinas. Not a bad lawyer either.